Good afternoon. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We are excited to have over 220 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee an ICE mouse pad and gift card for answering this trivia question. Name one of the NFL teams based in Missouri, the headquarters of today's sponsor, Universal Medical. Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you are answering, I want to invite everyone to join us for the Fall MP Expo, which will bring together HDM professionals from across the nation to Orlando, Florida for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services. Registration is now open. Receive your complimentary admission by using the VIP pass found in today's Webinar Wednesday workbook. Details can be found at www.mdexposhow.com forward slash Orlando. All right, and the winner of our ice mouse pad and gift card is Daniel Vogel. Congratulations, Daniel. The correct answer is either the St. Louis Rams or the Kansas City Chiefs. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Universal Medical. Universal Medical has nurtured a business philosophy founded on offering comprehensive nuclear medicine equipment services at a reduced price. Universal Medical's products and services include new and reconditioned nuclear imaging systems, quality parts, excellent equipment service, training courses for healthcare technology managers, camera system moves, technical and clinical support, flexible financing options, and more. Visit UNI dash med.com for more information. Our presenters today are Nick Iwana, VP of Corporate Quality and Customer Support Service, Craig Snodgrass, National Service Manager, and Craig Diener, Senior Support Manager at Universal Medical. Our moderator today is Wayne Webster, Principal of Proactive Consulting. Wayne, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, and thank you for attending today's webinar. As a rule, webinars you attend consist of a lecture with slides. Today we're going to take a bit of a different approach. We've assembled a panel of three experts in nuclear medicine, and we'll be asking them to field questions that we hope will help you keep your imaging equipment and your department at peak performance and efficiency. Uh, once again, I'd like to introduce the panel. We, they all hail from Universal Medical, and for, this, for the purposes of this conversation, we'll just call it Universal. Universal focuses exclusively in nuclear medicine, and on the panel we have Craig Diener, who's a senior product manager, Nick Iwana, vice president of corporate quality and customer support services and clinical support, and Craig Snodgrass, who's the national service manager. Again, my name is Wayne Webster, and I'll be your moderator. Let's start out with a question for Nick Iwana. Nick, from your broad experience in nuclear medicine, is there a key component or components to producing high-value patient images and maintaining that quality within a particular department? There are a number of key components but that, that, that can maintain the quality. And quality imaging is, is extremely important. Just, just to preface that a little bit in nuclear medicine, nuclear medicine is unique and it, has, it plays a key role in making diagnosis because of its functional imaging for diagnosing patients that have heart disease, cancer, and a number of other diseases. And heart disease and cancer, as we know, are the one and two number one killers, so to speak, of diseases in, in the country. So it plays a key role. So quality image is really important. Some key components from a camera standpoint it's vitally important that the camera operations, the overall camera operations, are, are performing up to their specification. The mechanicals, the mechanical operation is vitally important. The positioning, whole body imaging, spec imaging, all of those motions are calibrated, functioning uh, to their fullest capacity. Um, is the gantry moving appropriately? These are vitally important, and is that calibration of those really important in order to create Get that quality image to make that diagnosis. Related to the camera and separate from the motions and vitally important are the detector operations. That's the 
that what actually produces the image. That's what produces that image. And is the uniformity, is the calibration, is the resolution of that up to performance standard for optimal, optimal imaging. Um, these all need to meet these quality standards in order to create quality imaging. Separately, a little bit different than that, is the ability of the technologists for their, for their technical competency. Are they, are they able to utilize the camera to its fullest capability? Have they had the training, the proper training, in order to use the acquisition, the processing, in order to create the best diagnostic images? So that physician, that either your radiologist or whoever that interpreting physician can communicate some type of a diagnostic uh, result that the referring physician can utilize and utilize in order to help that patient uh, with their disease and, and maybe hopefully curing that disease. Thank you, Nick. Um, let's do a follow-on on that question. Um, Craig Snodgrass, as the service manager for Universal, how important is it to have the staff up to date on training with particular devices, remembering that departments may have one, two, or three cameras or more that are from different manufacturers or different models? From the service side, it's extremely important for the technologists to be very familiar with each system that they are working with. When, when we do receive a call from a customer that is having a problem, we immediately want to get that caller in contact with an engineer or a tech support specialist so they can dis discuss what the caller is experiencing to determine the correct course of action. Uh, so for example, if a, if a caller, if we get a call and they say, uh, we're having a bad noise when the camera moves, the first thing we're gonna wanna know and the first questions we're gonna wanna ask are, which motion is it that the noise is coming from? Is it during detector radius? Uh, is, it, uh, is it during gantry rotate? Um, if it is rotate, is it when it's moving in a clockwise or a counterclockwise uh, motion? So just simply knowing the motions of your system. And then what we may want you to do is exercise that motion individually using the hand controller where, rather than a, a preset motion to see when we do experience the noise. So knowing how to operate each system individually is also important. Another example, um, which is also a fairly common call we might receive, uh, something like, uh, my system is locking up and, and I have to shut it down to, to continue. Okay, well our first question to that is going to be, what's locking up? Is it, is it your processing PC? Is it your acquisition PC? Or is it coming from the gantry itself? Uh, so simply knowing the different parts of the camera um, would, would help to answer those questions. And once we determine that what the locked up is coming from, um, how are you doing a shutdown is probably going to be the next question we're going to ask. Um, unfortunately, we too often hear the tech reply to the, the answer to that as, I simply flip the switch and then it comes back up. Uh, that's something we never want to hear. That turning these systems off without doing a proper shutdown um, can really damage hard, hard drives mainly is, is what that will affect, uh, but that is, that is never a, a good thing. Um, my point to all this is, there is there's a specific shutdown process for each system, so knowing that shutdown process for the exact system you're working on is very important. And, it, you know, if, if it's the gantry locking up, maybe just power cycling the gantry rather than doing any sort of shutdown to the, to, to the PCs might take care of that. Um, all of this and, and being able to work with that um, FSE or tech support specialist on the phone it all helps to, to be highly trained on the exact system that you are working on and, and calling about. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. Let's stick with you for a minute and let's continue on these service-related issues. When a camera is having problems or it's just totally down, I imagine that there's a desire on the part of the user to get that camera up and going as quickly as possible. How can the caller help the service person understand the problem and hopefully lead to a fast return to service? Uh, well, first and most important on, on this topic would be to be in front of the camera and able to answer a few questions when you make that call. Um, although it, it, it's our job to actually fix the system and your job to, to you know, as a technologist to operate the system, it does take both of us working together to provide the, the, the safest possible nuclear system that we can. Keeping that statement in mind, 
it's amazing how many calls we get from technologists who are already in the car headed home when they do give us a call and say, hey, my system's down. Uh, we'd really like to have it up tomorrow. Can you let me know when things are up and going? Unfortunately, in cases like that, that probably adds about a day of downtime, simply because now when our FSC does arrive on site, he is simply starting from scratch, trying to you know operate the, the system to see where, where it is having the, the problem. Um, with just five or 10 minutes with that technologist before they leave for the day, once they've experienced the problem, an engineer or a, again, a tech support specialist can walk them through a series of checks um, to see where the problem is coming from. And that may lead us to, to a portion of the camera that we know, okay, if this has normally happened, it's probably one of these few items. So we can have the parts shipped out to be there at the time that the, the technician arrives so that he has very limited troubleshooting he has to do. He's actually coming in and fixing the system immediately instead of spending time troubleshooting, ordering parts, waiting for them to arrive, and then f fixing the system. Great. Thank you, Craig. Um, a little more from you. Um, let's discuss the importance of uh, quality control. What types of QC should the de department be conducting and on what kinds of a schedule? There are a few different QC checks that should be performed regularly. Uh, the most common would be the extrinsic QC checks. These should be completed on a daily basis and, and they should actually be completed first thing of the morning. That way you get a sense of, of how the camera is operating for that day and, and you are, are fully aware that, that your images are, uh, are in, in the manner that they should be before you put your first patient on. Another check would be uh, intrinsic QC. Most of our customers perform this more on a weekly basis, but by completing both of these checks regularly and tracking your QC numbers, customers will, will have a better understanding and feel for their system and, and how it is operating, and will know ahead of time if, if maybe there's some, some QC image quality that's, that, that's not at its best. The main thing when doing these QC checks is to do them the same way each and every time you do them. For instance, if you're using some sort of spacers like a, a cup or glove boxes to place between the collimator and the cobalt sheet source, when you do an extrinsic, uh, try to place them the same way each day. Or if you're radiusing detectors together uh, so that they're a, a certain position, try to put them in the same position each time you do it. Another item that would go back to being trained and, and knowing the specific system would be knowing how to check the peak or the spectrum on your detectors. That way, if you do see variances in your QC numbers, that should be one of the first things you, you, you check would be your peak. Um, so if, if you're completing an extrinsic cobalt, of course, you would want the cobalt to peak around 122, 123 keV. And with technesium, you want to be in the 140 keV range. Other checks to do would be a, a COR or center of rotation. This will confirm that your gantry is within specs while performing spec studies. Doing a BARS QC, whether you do that intrinsically or extrinsically, will confirm the linearity of the detector is good and that it will produce clear, crisp images. Uh, both the QC and the BARS should be completed on either a weekly or a biweekly basis. Thank you again, Craig. I really appreciate that. Uh, lots of good information. Uh, a little more. Uh, let's talk about um, clients who have service contracts and those that don't. I know you run into both. Um, do you find that most people have service contracts so they can keep up with this maintenance? How, how do you see it? Uh, we do have customers that, that are on both sides of that fence. Um, some of our customers want that peace of mind that comes with the contract that not only will their system be taken care of immediately and put high on the list when service calls come in, but also that, that they can budget for, for that annual cost to maintain their system and they have no, no surprises. Um, some of the others prefer to, let's say, roll the dice a little uh, when, when it comes to maintenance and, and sometimes the cost of that can be a little bit higher and, and it can be a little unexpected because you don't know when those costs are going to arise. We also have some that elect to go with, with what we provide as a, a PM only contract. With that, they can budget for the required preventative maintenance um, and then pay for any additional services as they arise. But no, no matter which one of these you, you choose, as with any piece of equipment, you know, even, even your car, it's very important to know what the OEM recommendations for maintenance are um, and keep them, that, that'll help keep them at, a, at an optimal performance. 
From from my experience, when we get calls on a on a system that, that has not been properly maintained, some of the main issues will be cleaning and the mechanicals. With all the moving parts, you know, there's chains, there's bearings, there's acme screws. Those need to be greased on a regular basis. Uh, now, a lot of times with irregular maintenance, they might be greased, but more, even more importantly than that is, is taking off some of the old grease. Uh, grease will, will harden and dry out over time, um, and that'll even cause more strain on the drive of that motion than if it didn't have any grease on it at all. Um, and as we all know, the motors, motor driver boards, and power supplies, those things are, 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 can be a little bit ex exp expensive, and we want them to last as long as possible. Where the lack of cleaning can come in is with fans and, and the filters. Um, keeping electronical boards and power supplies cool and performing correctly is done by the airflow. Without it, voltages start to drift, and when that occurs, the detectors will, uh, the image quality won't be near, near as good. Um, again, the main point here is knowing the OEM maintenance recommendations and requirements and abiding to them. So it sounds like that last statement you just made is really important for people who aren't on contracts. If they're going to go naked, if you will, they really do need to know what the OEM recommend, recommends for their machine. That is very correct, Wayne, yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Craig. That was great. Um, let's turn back to Nick Iwana. Um, Nick, expanding on what we just heard from Craig, he gave us a lot of information. Is there a clinical impact to poor data? daily uh, quality maintenance and other scheduled maintenance? Absolutely. What Craig was able to offer is, is important, and I really alluded it to, to it in my, uh, my first answer about you know, the equipment operations, mechanical and detectors. Craig uh, expounded upon that a little bit further and was really valuable. But, um, and it's very, I can't stress the importance of that maintenance. But, and, and here's why. There's a couple of real life scenarios, so real life examples. That, that of why we do this clinically and what's the importance of it in making diagnosis. Uh, Craig mentioned about the COR, or center of rotation, which is um, applied during your spec studies. It actually, uh, as the camera rotates around that patient to create an emission, emission tomography, it has to register, accurately register in that patient uh, where that camera is in order to create that, that spec study. If that COR is not accurate and it's not, it is not calibrated correctly, um, there can be defects created in the images. And some of these can be you know, subtle, some not so subtle. Um, you can get what we call ring artifacts, you know, very obvious. It's, it's not going imp to impact the diagnosis because it's gonna, you're going to have a study that you can't even read. More subtle. It's what I've seen before, and when we're doing cardiac spec. In cardiac spec, what I've seen before, if the COR isn't correct, it actually creates a subtle defect in the cardiac wall. When in, what we're doing in cardiac spec is we're actually looking at the heart muscle and how it is functioning. So if we create a subtle defect, an area that doesn't show up in the heart, and it looks like a defect or there might be a heart attack or what we call an ischemic event where there's not blood supply to the vessel. What happens then is that physician can read that as a possible previous heart attack or a heart attack and a defect and actually, if that's not calibrated correctly, the COR is actually causing mechanical or what we call a false positive. It's read as a positive diagnosis, but it's actually false because the camera is actually creating that, and that's vitally important. Another real-life example is a situation that I actually was involved with on a, on a cardiac camera. We're doing it. When we're imaging with the cardiac agents, the radiopharmaceutical, that agent is picked up in the heart muscle. However, that same agent also is picked up in tumors. And if I've seen on a patient, this is an example of a female patient that came in, and when we are analyzing after we did the spec study on the, for the cardiac, when you analyze the pre-processed information, you see kind of the body around the heart as a spec as it rotates around each frame. What we found was a, what we call a hot spot up in the armpit or the axial node. And we tried to clean that up, thought it was contamination, radioactive contamination, which can occur if you get a little drop here and there. So we cleaned that off 
and we tried to clean it off and we rescanned the patient. However, that was still there. As we analyzed that patient's history, she had a previous history of breast cancer. In making that, being able to see that little spot, having the resolution of the camera correct, what we found, we were able, outside of her cardiac analysis, we found that she actually had a reoccurrence of the tumor. And we could report that and respond to that. And that's a real life example of that. Another example is in the mechanical end um, on a patient that I was not on a cardiac camera. Um, we actually had a patient, in, of course, with Nupra Medicine, we're injecting in the vein, and that's how, we, that's how we get the material into the organs in the body by the vein. This patient has bad veins. A lot of these patients have poor vascularity. So we are trying to find an IV. Uh, they tried to find a vein four, four, five, six times. Well, we found the vein. We started to meet the patient, and we started to get motion errors. It was, we had errors in the camera. We tried to get through it, but unfortunately, we couldn't complete that study because the system didn't perform up to what it needed to be. These are some real-life examples of the you know, clinical importance of why we do that maintenance, the preventative maintenance, and, we're, and we have that the, the resolution and the mechanicals up par. Thank you, Nick. Let's stay on this issue of proper maintenance for just a bit, but take a little turn. Uh, Craig Diener, as someone with almost 25 years of experience in nuclear medicine, have you seen a change in the way users of spec cameras view maintenance now versus, say, 10 to 20 years ago? And if you would, tell us what you think's changed. Yes, um, excuse me. Yes, there has been more focus on camera maintenance in recent years. Um, budget pressure and decrease in reimbursements has driven facilities to look for other ways to lower their costs. So a lot of sites are now using their clinical engineering departments to do first pass service and preventive maintenance maintenance. We're seeing more utilization of the biomed departments on larger equipment such as nuclear medicine, CT, and MR, for example. Clinical engineering overall has been a fast-growing industry in recent years, and we've seen this enrollment increase in our class offerings as a result. But the inclusion of the clinical engineering department helps reduce the number of calls to the service company and also increase the uptime and the throughput of the nuclear medicine department. Thank you. Uh, continuing on with the daily use of the camera, Craig Diener. Craig Snodgrass reviewed some of the QC uh, users should be addressing daily and weekly. What are some of the issues that occur from regular use of spec cameras, and are there ways for the technology to address some of these issues before they become problems? Yes, as Nick and Craig both pointed out, you know, there's constant moving parts on these cameras, so regular maintenance is critical. Grease tends to dry out and can cause motion problems, as Nick mentioned. Mechanical parts are cleaned and greased on a regular basis to ensure smooth operation. Heat is the biggest enemy with any electronic equipment. And in, in the case of nuclear cameras, it can cause tube drift, which result in peak shift and image quality problems. So the scanning room should always be kept in an air-conditioned environment between 60 and 80 degrees. So airflow is important in keeping your camera cool. So my suggestion is to do a walkthrough during your daily QA process and make sure the fans are working properly, filters are cleaned, and above all, make sure your UPS is functioning correctly. Just some basic housekeeping and regular PMs will go along with keeping your camera running for many years. Good, thanks. Um, and this will be a bit of a skeptical, skeptical question, but people ask it. Um, again, Craig Snodgrass addressed a lot of issues with daily maintenance and the importance of that schedule. But is it really important? I mean, what can go wrong uh, with the camera is sort of a surprise if, if we aren't doing those schedules and we're not maintaining them on a regular basis. Not maintaining your, your QC on a regular basis um, is, is not a good thing. I mean, you, you've got to keep up with the PMs, uh, knowing the, the OEM uh, requirements. Um, again, that goes back to the, the, the greasing, 
and and the the heat, um, keeping fans re replaced as as needed and filters cleaned. Those are the main things uh, with, with the QC and keeping up with the required PMs. All right. Some thanks. examples might be, you know, with excessive heat, your uh, tube coupling can break down, and then you have, you know, grease dripping down on the patients, you know, just one drop at a time. You know, just things like that could happen, as we mentioned. Um, and then your basic grease on your motions can cause big problems that can dry out. So just to reiterate that, so. Okay. Hey, thanks, guys. That's great. Back to Craig Snodgrass. Um, as the service manager, um, you've talked about service and the importance of maintaining proper QC and maintenance schedules. But what about another part of service um, that I'm sure you encounter, which is operator error? Do you find that sometimes when you get that service request that it's the operator that's in error rather than the camera hardware or software issue? It's not uncommon to run into that, but as an experienced FSE, you never want to specifically point that out. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a delicate situation, but when we do get those calls, I mean, most of our FSEs, they're going to work with the technologist, and if it's, if it's something we can do over the phone and we believe that they may have an issue, um, at, at our disposal, uh, we have some some very good clinical apps with Mr. Nick Iwana here. So we can, you know, do a, maybe a three-way call with the technologist, RFSE, and Nick on the phone um, so that Nick can maybe listen and, l listen and, and go over the steps that the technologist is, is taking um, and, and see if there is an error there. If we happen to be on site, you know, maybe the FSE himself listens to the tech. Uh, if, if he's got any ideas, maybe they can try something different. Or maybe himself, he'll he'll basically take over the camera and walk through the steps as she's doing them, see what his result is. If he has an idea, change those steps up a little bit, run them his way, see if it makes a difference. Um, but again, using Nick for our clinical apps uh, can be very important to, to have that ability. Very good. So um, if I understand what you just said, at the point at which you've determined determine that an end user is having the issue, um, you switch them over to clinical apps there at Universal. Is that right? That is usually the, the steps that we try to take, yes. Run it down through the possibilities of it being uh, a, a system error. Um, and, and then if, if we still believe that it is, is an operator error or, or just maybe the steps the operator is taking, at that point, yes, we would, we would get Nick involved and turn it over to him. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Nick, since we're talking about you, um, when field service is finished uh, with, the, with the client and they refer them over to you, what does your department do typically as you um, assist the client in moving forward in their knowledge base? Well, I want to just say that, you know, we can't, you know, come on, technologists, we never make any errors. I don't know, operator, what are you talking about? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just, but, it, and actually, Craig made a, a, a good point because a lot of, you know, if, if we can, sometimes it could be operator error, sometimes it could be camera, and that's why if we, if we can all work together, we can, we can figure that out if we haven't figured it out what, why it's doing it mechanically or why the images look a certain way so I can, I can provide some help with that. But my role, you know, is, is, is that role that Craig kind of alluded to is, is to pr provide that support to our, from, from their clinical needs. And, you know, and assist them with advisement on, on, on how to produce good diagnostic images. And, and this support can be provided quite often. We can, I do it over the phone um, or remotely. Um, but on occasion, and, and it does happen that I actually go physically be on site to help the technologists look at their acquisition protocols or, or their protocols on, on how they're setting up the procedure or all the parameters set up for optimal imaging. Or, and a lot of it is involved, once we've got that image produced off the camera, a lot of it is manipulation, manipulation with the processing pro protocols. It's troubleshooting from that aspect of it as well. And, and also, are they using the camera uh, to perform good patient studies? Are, are they setting up procedures or appropriately to get the best images. And addition, I'll go back to it, is, is are they performing QC procedures correctly? And are they analyzing those and are they documenting them? One thing that I'll do also with, the, with them, as we know, um, a lot of our health 
HTMs that are out there that are that are participating today. Um, they know they've got to get their CEs, and we get a CE credit today for this on um, this presentation. Technologists also, in order to maintain their licensure, have to get CEs. Um, I've offered to them in my training, on site training, uh, that they have the ability, ability to get their CEs. And getting that CEs is, a, is just that continue education for them to, to become educated you know, in the practice of nuclear medicine operating your systems. Another little maybe non-clinical thing that I will do on site and actually over the phone that I do with them is it relates to working working together with the engineer, uh, the clinical engineer on site or the service engineer who's coming in there to, to help them with the maintenance Technologist is the eyes and ears of that camera. They're with that camera every day. Craig alluded to the noises that are being made. Yeah, I try to teach them to be aware of, are you hearing grinding notes, noise? Where is it occurring? Are you seeing errors that are actually occurring? And, and may, I'll love teaching them to be able to highlight, to take note of those and communicate at the engineer, so that will help as a team to maintain equipment to its fullest capacity. Thank you, Nick. That was uh, interesting. Gentlemen, let's switch gears a bit and talk about acquiring a nuclear camera. As a senior product manager, Craig Diener, I'm sure you've spoken with many people over the years who were shopping for another camera either to add to the practice or replace an existing device. What kind of advice do you give them? Well, just like buying a car or a house, you know, a new camera is a major investment that you have to live with for quite a few years. So take your time and do some research before you purchase. You need to be sure you're buying the right product for your department. Uh, let me give you some examples. Over the years, I've seen customers who purchased every option that was available for a camera only to find out year or two later, they never used that option. So that was money that was not well spent. We've seen probably multiple times where customers buy a camera and find out during the delivery process that it won't fit in the room and then suddenly they're faced with emergency construction costs or emergency uh, search for a, a room that's big enough to accommodate the camera. So, you know, don't make those mistakes. So biggest advice is start by seeking input from your staff. By your staff, I'm referring to not only the people who use the camera, also the people who read the images from the camera, as well as the people who work on the camera. Um, and they may all be the facility, they may not be. But uh, you need to find out, you know, what is the current patient load? How many studies do they expect to perform on the camera on a given week? Uh, do they expect the volume to grow? And then analyze what the department costs are and what camera you can afford. Next, I would say determine the type of camera that is needed, whether it's a general purpose workhorse camera, dedicated cardiac, or overflow camera. Find out, too, what options and features are important to the people using the camera. Is new technology really important for the volume they're doing? Or if the volume of the revenue is expected to grow, maybe it is. If not, maybe just a basic spec camera is all that's needed. You know, determine how much room you have for the camera and if more room can be secured ahead of time. Like I said, you don't want to face a situation where you have to find some emergency room to put it in. Um, consider the life expectancy of the camera. You're going to keep it five years, ten years, and then you can make good decisions based on that. So once you have all this data, you can start contacting the vendors, see what offerings they have that fit your needs. Explore all the options, not the two or three of the large vendors, but take a look at some of the others as well. Be sure to consider the possibility of a reconditioned camera. These can save you 40, 50, 60 percent compared to new ones but still offer the same options. And then finally, once you narrow down the best possible fit, go back to your team and make sure everyone's in agreement and then select the best camera for your department. Thank you, Craig. Let's turn our attention back to Nick Iwana. We, Nick, we just heard what Craig told us about analyzing that purchase of a, another spec camera. 
What's the clinical applications person? What do you say to people who are um, interested in buying another camera? How do you advise them? Well, Craig had, had some good points when it talked about the, you know talking to the people and from a clinical, the technologist and the physician. But to expand on that a little bit more, um, he mentioned about you know a little bit about the the patients. You know, well, well, also in their patient you know, growth and now also what type of patients, what type of referring physicians uh, are, are, do they have now? Uh, are they anticipating and growing to? And this will kind of dictate, okay, what kind of clinical procedures might they be utilizing down the road or are you down the road that they aren't utilizing that are available to them? And, and is the camera capable of, of performing those procedures? Not just the camera, but the software. Um, and that's part of what he's mentioned that when Craig mentioned about the physicians. Uh, Physicians have a way of wanting to see images in a certain format. They're used to certain processing protocols and the results of those protocols. So their feedback is valuable clinically on the quantitative programs that are available and the display programs that are available so that they can read the images appropriately. So that software capabilities and the so what the software is capable to do clinically that fits with their Imaging portfolio is very important. Are they doing long imaging? Um, are they doing long imaging with a radioactive gas versus an aerosol? Um, that will, of course, determine how they're going to set up their room. Do the cardiac imaging are they doing? Are they, uh, and one important aspect of that is the type of imaging clinically. What type of collimator? If, um, if they're doing general technetium imaging, which is the primary agent that we use a low energy collimator is used if they're going to be involved with doing uh, some of the higher energy uh, procedures that use antibodies or that diagnose cancers or white blood cells that we can use with what's called an in, in, agent called indium um, primarily that's a higher energy they will need a, a medium energy collimator in order to perform those procedures are the thyroid images uh, the thyroid, quite often, they can use uh, what we call parallel hole collimators. But some of the physicians, because of their reading propensity, may want a pinhole collimator that gives them a better resolution. So these these aspects of clinically is what what we what, I, what we want to find out what they're doing now and in the future. And also, is there training? Uh, you know, we want to train those in the technologists, what's their, what are their ability with working with the camera in the past? Do they have a history of working with the camera and the software? And what is going to be the curve, the learning curve for them and the training available to, to train them appropriately so they're using the camera to its fullest capacity? Thanks, Nick. That was very informative. All right, over to Craig Snodgrass. Craig, let's get to where the rubber meets the road. For the person who's responsible for installation and service, what do you advise people uh, when they're thinking about adding another camera? What should they be thinking about? Well, to kind of expound on what, on what Mr. Craig Diener was talking about, starting simply with getting the system from the delivery truck to the room, uh, what is that path like? Uh, will we be crossing carpet, tile, ceramic tile? Uh, will floor protection be required you know, as the pieces are, are rolled into the facility? Um, elevators play a huge part, uh, both, both their weight capacity and the physical inside dimensions of the elevators can be important. Um, all of the systems can be separated into several smaller pieces, you know, to be reassembled in the room, but what is the weight of the gantry itself while it's in its smallest form, and is the elevator rated to handle that weight? Uh, the physical dimension usually comes into play with the patient table or a pallet, um, because those are usually the longest piece of equipment we have to fit on an elevator. Um, hallway widths, uh, doorway widths, those need to be considered. Can we get down the hall? Can we get in the door with the, the, the widest, largest piece that, that has, to be, has to be moved? Uh, are there any 90 degree corners in the hallway that, that we have to be able to go around? Um, one, and then once we're able to travel into the room, what about the floor of the room? Um, the first of that would be the floor covering. If it's new construction, that's usually not an issue. Uh, but if we're going to place a system in the same room where another system has just been removed, uh, there may be some need for floor covering work to be done first. Um, different cameras have different footprints, different shapes, different sizes, so the area they cover may not be the same. So if, if there is no floor, floor covering redone from the removal to the in installation, 
um, there may be some exposed floor that, that previously was covered with the old camera. So now the floor coloring, you know, just from wear and tear on the floor, uh, may be different and un unsightly. Um, most of the cameras are anchored to the floor. So another consideration is the thickness of the floor, the concrete of the floor, um, and knowing the recommended depth of the anchors uh, that are required to mount the system is important. Or if there was anchors left from the old system, will they be in the way if they weren't completely removed once that system left? Um, another aspect of knowing the thickness of the floor, um, and I know this from personal experience, I actually did an install where we actually had to get the, uh, the structural engineer involved. Uh, and he was able to inform the facility that we could put this camera in this room, but we had to angle it in the room. That way, the, the weight of the camera was spread over three different floor joists uh, just to, to hold that weight capacity. So those are things to consider. Um, heating and air conditioning is important. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, keeping these systems cool is important, but just important as, as keeping them cool is keeping that temperature constant and not fluctuating. Uh, that can really mess with your QC imaging. Um, so making sure you, you have the right capacity of air conditioner or heater, whether you're in a warm or, or cool climate, uh, is very important. Uh, the power itself to run these systems. Um, of course, all systems should have a UPS, but the power to the UPS has to be correct. Some systems use regular uh, 110, 115 volt. Some have 208 uh, recommendations. Some need a dedicated 30 amp line. Some need a dedicated 50 amp service. So knowing all of those and, and being able to have that room ready for that installation um, is very important. Uh, all of these items that I, I just mentioned they're, 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 and the requirements by the OEM are provided in any, any of their documentation. So make sure that you, you're able to, to get that from, from the camera provider and be prepared to meet all of those requirements uh, before you make the decision on your, on your system and prepare to install it. Great, thank you, Craig. Again, very informative. Okay, gentlemen, now that we're speaking about replacing or purchasing cameras, let's continue a little further down this road. I'm gonna ask each member of our panel to respond to this next question. And we'll start with Craig Diener. I get questions from my clients and others who are considering the purchase of spec cameras, and for many, because of budgetary constraints, it's the first time they've thought about used devices. Frequently, they're confused by what they're being told by vendors. I think this confusion is because the jargon used to describe the condition of these devices is not well defined. Words like refurbished, reconditioned, and others are used interchangeably. Craig, tell us what you think potential buyers should know when considering the purchase of pre-owned equipment. Well, you're right. There, There is no standard as to what all these terms or actually are, there's no real definition, but I mean, pre-owned equipment can be broken down into several categories, ranging from used or as is to remanufactured. But um, we have seen, you know, several people say, yes, it's refurbished when in fact it may have just been painted or who knows what was done to it. But let's talk about refurbished and reconditioned for a little bit. The terms are often used inter interchangeably, but you know, do they mean the same thing? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But when you purchase a pre-owned product, no matter how it's presented, whether it's refurbished, reconditioned, remanufactured, you know, ask what the process is that they use to get the system back to a like new condition. A truly reconditioned system should be deinstalled from the previous site and brought to a reconditioning factory where it's staged disassembled, painted, cleaned, reassembled, calibrated, just to name a few of the top level processes. Um, tube coupling should always be checked for aging. Crystals should be inspected for hydration and replaced as needed. Uh, the system should be configured to the customer's order and a factory quality checks all should be performed. Each unit should have its own device history record that shows what was done to the system while it was in the factory. And then every system should include some type of a warranty. So ask the vendor, you know, what's, what is their service and support? Who will service the camera once it's installed in your facility? What experience does he or she have on that particular camera? Make sure they have a good supply of parts available to service the system throughout the warranty period and beyond. And uh, make sure the parts that they use are tested 
in a working system to assure that it'll work when they install it in your system. Always ask the vendor to describe their refurbished and reconditioning process so you can be assured you're getting a system that'll perform like new. Thank you, Craig. Craig Snodgrass, again, from your perspective, installation and service, what would you recommend uh, to the folks who are considering the acquisition of a pre-owned device? Well, with everything Mr. Diener just said about knowing what condition that system is uh, before you purchase it, my question is, what is that system like when it leaves where you purchased it from till it arrives at your facility? How will it be transferred? How will it be packaged? How long will it be be spending time on a on a tractor trailer? Um, you know, if you're shipping something to a to a hot climate, you sure don't want that system sitting outside for a day or two waiting for installation or in transit as it gets really hot in those in, in those trucks. Um, that's a, that is very important. The paint and everything on the system, you know, are, are they wrapped nice and, and covered or are they basically thrown on a truck and, and strapped in? So those are things to know uh, from the person you're, or the company you're purchasing from. How do they transport all of their equipment? Um, then when it comes to the actual installer, uh, to install these, these systems, it takes a highly trained FSE to know how to do a correct install and then to, to, maintain, and to maintain the system itself. So the, the engineer himself, what is his training? What is his experience on that system? Uh, just because you've been trained on something doesn't necessarily mean you can work on it until you've had some experience actually doing the work on that system. Um, and what, what kind of support does that field engineer have? If he does incur a problem that maybe he can't solve himself, what, is, what does he do for support? Who is backing him up uh, from his company standpoint? Uh, those are a few things to be considered as long as, as Mr. Diener said, parts. Um, the availability of the parts for these systems. And not only the availability, but what's the time frame once an FSE determines he needs a part, how long does it take for him to order and that part to arrive at your facility? Um, hopefully it's next day, but that's something that, that you always want to know. Uh, those are just a few things from the, from the installation and service side that, that I recommend you consider. Thank you, Craig. Uh, again, informative as always. Uh, Nick, Nick Iwana, what about your perspective, clinical apps, training, all of that when considering a piece of used equipment? Well, from the technologist standpoint, you know, to, to get them acclimated, they need to know pretty much everything that, that they can use to be able to produce the images. And I'm, I don't, I'll keep my answer fairly succinct here uh, because of the fact that um, it's important for them to, I don't want to re just to reiterate that the effective use of that camera and the computer to make diagnostic images is very important. So, and what entails in all of this, and that means QC and, and, and acquisition protocols, all that aspect which I've covered or talked about briefly before. But what's vitally important is, is in the training, uh, getting the appropriate training for them so that they are acclimated and they can produce the camera. And what's, what's important from my standpoint is that applications training, is that training is performed for them that meets them so that they're comfortable in being able to produce those images. And that training is usually quite often is done, I do it on, on site um, with them, spend a few days or whatever it takes for them in order to get acclimated and also work with the physicians. So everything works in the flow so that they're clinically capable of, of really performing the procedures they need. Thank you, Nick. And let me say thank you to our panelists for sharing their many years of experience with our attendees. Okay, thank you. Lots of great discussion taking place on today's webinar. We've already gone uh, close to about 50 minutes here, so we've got time for a few questions, uh, one of which that came through during the presentation. Uh, what percentage of users have in-house staff trained to do their own maintenance on this type of equipment? Uh, I'll take that. That's okay. This is Craig Diener. You mean? Um, I'm not really aware or I'm not for sure what that percentage might be, and I don't know of any entities that really track that metric at all. But as I mentioned earlier in our discussion, 
we have definitely seen an increase in enrollment of biomeds in our uh, in our class offerings that we have here at Universal. So that's pretty evident. Also, we've seen quite a few uh, increase in attendance at trade shows by the clinical engineering department. So, I mean, it's evident that that is a growing business and uh, definitely they are, um, they are expected to work more and more on some of the bigger ticket items, like I said, CT, MR, nuclear medicine, x-ray, you know, not just some of the smaller ticket items like patient monitoring and such. So, um, yeah. This is Craig Snargrass from the service side, and again, I'm not aware of of the the percentage uh, to answer that, but but I, I do know that we do a lot of tech support, um, and a lot of the tech support that we do to do provide um, goes out to a lot of biomedical engineers. Um, you know, maybe they're purchasing their parts through us and we're helping them out, or, or maybe they just know that we do have the resources to, to help them answer some questions that they may have, uh, because most of them are going to have a little bit of lack in experience. They're just not going to have their hands on that equipment very often, especially if that facility only has, you know, one, maybe two, and there might even be different systems, not even the same system. So uh, we do provide a lot of tech support, so I, I know that is becoming a little more regular itself, but I, again, I, I don't know the numbers. Okay, thank you for that. We've got another question that came in. Please discuss the feasibility of in-house service, specifically PM. Okay. Well, in-house service can definitely save a lot of money in the long run, but something I do want to point out, this is a big however. However, you have to make sure that the people who are working on this equipment is properly trained. Once again, this goes back to our class offerings. Um, they need to be trained on how to do a PM or how to do basic, uh, basic functional imaging, you know, quality QC floods, that sort of thing, as well as how to do some of the basic repairs on a given system. Along with that, especially here at Universal, I mean, you've got the backup of a well-trained staff here at Universal or some of the other companies like Universal that can help you out, whether it's tech support calls, whether it's uh, on-site support, however that may be. So, you know, no matter what kind of predicament you might be in, there's always somebody there to help you. And again, from the service side, I would say PMs, uh, doing them in-house, uh, again, they've got to be trained. They've got to know what they're doing. That is one of the most important aspects to keeping your system running at its optimal and for the longest period of time. Um, so again, just make sure they're trained um, and, and know know what the OEM requirements are. I know you've heard us say that several times today, all three of us, OEM requirements. That is very important. Great. Uh, we have uh, time for one more question, I think, and just came through. Approximately what is the total number, number of hours of training required to become quote unquote qualified? It's hard to put a number on that. Um, someone to become qualified um, actually would probably have to have an electronics degree at a minimum um, of training outside the nuclear industry. Um, I know from experience and actually bringing, bringing individuals in and, and training them up and putting them in the field, uh, honestly, it takes about two years for us to feel comfortable to put an FSE, a field service engineer, out in the field and let him run his own territory. And in that two years, he's most likely spent time in-house um, doing parts refurbishment, actual product refurbishment. So he has learned that system from the ground up, either testing parts or completely refurbishing a system before it is sold. Um, this isn't something you can just jump into and know how to work on anything. Um, and again, the, the electronics degree and a mechanical background, uh, just because you know electronics doesn't mean that you're, you're mechanically inclined um, it takes a special person for that. And, and as a service manager, uh, to let you know what I look for, I want an FSC. I want somebody that can not only fix the piece of equipment, but they need to, need to be able to, to work with and fix the customer as well. And what I mean by that is customers always have questions. Anytime you walk in the door, you know, they're asking us questions about this and that, just different parts of the camera. And our guys have the experience going from site to site, talking from tech to tech, 
and with other FSEs that they work with uh, to back them up to answer these questions, where a lot of your in-house guys just don't have that experience. Great. Well, thank you to our panel today, and thank you again to today's sponsor, Universal Medical. One lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. A reminder that you must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. If you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, one, that's the number one, technation.com forward slash webinars. Thanks, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.